Welcome to IDRC. My name is David Malone. I have the privilege of uh, working here. And we're very fortunate today to have with us the Secretary General of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, which pulls together actually a great deal of Asia south of China and uh, east of uh, India and South Asia. Uh, in an op-ed article that uh, Tommy Koh, the great uh, Singaporean uh, diplomat, and I wrote a couple of months ago in the Globe and Mail, we argued that uh, for Canadians interested in Asia, it's not enough to be interested in China and India because actually the connecting tissue between them uh, is uh, the ASEAN region. Secondly, it's a very fast-growing region. It's a very prosperous region, although quite diverse in terms of stages of development and a tremendously exciting opportunity for Canadians who wish to know more about the world, uh, wish to engage with the world uh, academically, uh, culturally, but of course uh, in terms of business as well. Indeed, the ASEAN area Canada uh, trade relationship is healthy. It will grow further, and so it needs to be an area of focus. And I think uh, our Foreign Minister John Baird is very strongly committed uh, to Canada's relationship with ASEAN, which is why he, like we, are so pleased that uh, the Secretary General can be with us. Uh, He's a man of many parts. Uh, he's himself uh, been a scholar. He's also been an academic administrator as a vice rector. He's been in his home country of Thailand, a member of parliament. He was a particularly distinguished foreign minister of his country. And I'm delighted that eventually all of ASEAN got to benefit from uh, his leadership. And I think it's been a terrific term uh, for a Secretary General of ASEAN. So what we'll do is uh, learn from him for the next ten, uh, 20 or 25 minutes or so, and then we'll have an exchange. Uh, some will be following this across the web, so we may get a remark or a question or two across the web, uh, but we'll hope to hear from those of you in the room with us today, too. Surin, the podium's yours. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very, very much, uh, IDRC, for this uh, very important opportunity for me as Secretary General of a small organization, 10 countries, 600 million people in Southeast Asia, to share with you some of the hopes aspiration, dreams, and vision that we have for ourselves. ASEAN was born when you were 100 years old. 1967, when Southeast Asia was still very much divided, when um, ideological uh, differences certainly were the driving force of international relations. Our leaders got together and decided that we needed a stage for ourselves that would not be crowded by the um, major players and personalities and heavyweights of the world. People who have gone to the Afro-Asia meeting in Bandung, Indonesia, people like Nasser, like Nehru, like Tito, like Nkrumah, like Zhou Enlai, those were the people at that time who were playing on the uh, emerging worlds or the third world's global stage. Five of our leaders got together from Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, the Philippines, and um, decided for and among themselves that we needed a small stage for ourselves. 
and we call ourselves the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Since then, this particular organization has given the region the only one official region-wide forum for security issues, for strategic political issues, and now more and more to evolve region-wide architecture for economic cooperation. I'm sorry, I'm more familiar with the, some of the scholarship down south of your border. I, I couldn't quote anybody except David Malone. But uh, it was Henry Kissinger who observed at the end of last century that as far as innovation and economic progress, economic dynamism are concerned, East Asia is very much 21st century Europe. But as far as systems and forums and fora and institutions to take care of the problems that could occur in the region, in the landscape, he said East Asia is still 19th century Europe. Well, ASEAN has been filling up that gap. ASEAN has been offering our forum and fora, our stage for all players in the region to come and articulate their interests, stake their claims, voice their concerns in a very, very open and transparent way. Together, we are able to create a more uh, stable environment for exchange of views of ideas Everybody feels comfortable. We are a threat to none. We accommodate all. That's how we have been playing this, what we call an architecture building for cooperation in East Asia with ASEAN in the middle. We began differently from the European Union. The European Union began with big major pay players on functional issues. We began with smaller group of countries wanting a stage for ourselves that we would not be crowded by global personalities and we have been able to bring in countries like Canada, like the US, like Russia, like China, Japan, Korea, Australia, the European Union through what we call the dialogue partnership. The dual purpose of ASEAN without full articulation of it from the very beginning, economic progress and democratization. We began, all of us, if you remember, if you look back, David, we began as a collection of centralized states. Very strong government provided stability, continuity, policy support for economic growth, for investment into all over countries. So along the way, we have been growing 6 7% in the 80s, 9 10%. And we have been able to provide a conducive, stable, and continuous uh, growth policy uh, environment that have attracted a lot of investment into the region. With the growth of, with the cons constant growth of, sustained growth of our economies, somehow we have been able to open up the space for more players in the system. Civil society develop, po political parties develop, academics have their own space for freedom, media has developed. Somehow all these countries have opened up matured up and have become more complex and more uh, sophisticated, somehow our people have earned their space, their freedom, and their quote-unquote democracy. Still a work in progress in many of our societies, our member states, but opening up is going in 
One Direction, the latest, the latest phenomenon, latest um, uh, development is the opening up of Myanmar. We have sustained a lot of pressure from the global community. Having Myanmar inside, try to open it, try to help it grow, try to help it democratize. We have been saying, let us do it our way, the ASEAN way, slow, gentle, giving advice, encouragement. But of course, the pressure from the global community also has been helpful. But together, we work to help Myanmar open. And it is now a darling of the global community. This very day, Madame Aung San Suu Kyi now is in Washington, is in New York, and she is a major player inside Myanmar and for the ASEAN landscape on the issue of democratization and human rights. So let me just say that the dual purpose of ASEAN from the beginning, economic growth and opening up of all these societies, and we are still committed and we are still uh, involved in this work in progress of opening up. Um, together, 600 million people, about 2 trillion US dollars combined GDP. Half of that is Indonesia. <laughs> the rest are small boutique economies, but together, two, 2 trillion. But we trade with the world about 2.4 trillion US dollars, and that's why it has become very attractive to the global community. Mr. Obama said, if the US is going to get out of our crisis, we have to export more, we have to sell more. And we look around, where are the consumers and where are the markets? It's you in East Asia, you in the middle of the growth center of East Asia. So. Middle class is growing, purchasing power is growing, and I think we are looking for not just physical growth, not just mat material growth. The middle class in ASEAN is looking for quality of life, is looking for better education for their children, and that's one of the areas that Canada can play a very, very significant role. I have just discussed with Mr. Ed Fast, your international trade minister this morning, that other countries look at their education as a commodity for export, look at their education as service for export, look at education as an area that would certainly bring a lot of foreign exchange. We certainly would like to see Canada being active in that particular area because the middle class is hungry for better quality of education for their children, either here or through some kind of cooperation and associations with universities in our region, in our landscape. Many American universities are doing that in Singapore. Australia is doing it in Malaysia and uh, European uh, countries are doing it in other parts of Southeast Asia. Canada certainly has the brand name, has the recognition, has the goodwill. And your multiculturalism is the way of the world, is the way of a globalized world. You don't only talk about it, you live it, you don't only articulate it, but you experience it every day. I come in and out of this country and feel that multiculturalism is a way of life here. It's not a slogan. It's not a, a, an advertisement. It's not a tagline. And parents around the world certainly appreciate that, particularly parents from Southeast Asia, parents from East Asia. So rising middle class, Expanding middle class, rising purchasing power is a field of investment that we certainly would like to see more Canadian expertise, more Canadian innovation, more Canadian business 
coming to Southeast Asia and take advantage of that growing landscape. Canada has been our dialogue partner for a long, long time. This is the 35th anniversary of ASEAN-Canada dialogue partnership. In fact, my trip is part of that celebration. Thank you very much. But there's tremendous opportunity open into the future. And it's only our own imagination and our own ingenuity that could put the limits on the growth of cooperation in the future. In the field of energy, in the field of uh, technology, particularly green and clean technology, in the field of innovation, in the field of agriculture, in the field of food security, in the field of energy security, these areas are areas of potential growth of cooperation and, uh, and, and relations between ASEAN and, um, and Canada. There are new architectures growing up in East Asia, and many of them are quite dynamic and exciting. One is called the East Asia Summit, and Canada is very much interested in that. East Asia Summit began in 2005, again, going back to the observation of Henry Kissinger. No institutions, no systems, no process that could take care of any potential problems. There are many fault lines, there are many flashpoints in East Asia, and you are reading about it. China and Japan, China and some of the countries in Southeast Asia, Japan and Korea, China and India. One province of India is still not recognized by China as belonging to, to India. So flashpoints and fault lines are everywhere. ASEAN is trying to build processes, institutions, and systems, forum and fora, that these issues could be addressed. East Asia Summit is one of that at the very highest level. It was born in 2005. Ten ASEAN countries plus six dialogue partners in the region. China, Japan, Korea, India, Australia, New Zealand. ASEAN plus six, we call it. The European Union would like to get in to that head table. Canada has expressed interest to come to join the head table. But that architecture is still evolving. We have just admitted last year the U.S. and Russia. And we would like to consolidate. We would like to make it work. We would like to make it effective. We have taken note of uh, Canada's interests in joining, and uh, Canada application is on active file. Let me put it that way. But certainly, uh, you know, we would like to see an intensification of Canada's presence, Canada's engagement, Canada's contribution into the region uh, to the full and let the momentum grow, and certainly IDRC can help. CEDA has been working actively at the level of the grassroots of the people on the issues of non-traditional uh, issues, non-traditional threats, non-traditional issues of uh, conflicts, of uh, uh, the soft issues of building a more livable community, issue of human security, issue of uh, poverty, issue of gender equality, issue of human rights, issue of governance, issue of the rule of law. These are the areas that um, SIDA, IDRC, have been active, actively engaged with us. The latest instrument that we have established together is called the ASEAN Canada Business Council. ACBC. This forum, this platform is going to serve as a springboard for further penetration of Canada's business into the ASEAN economies, the 10 ASEAN economies. And through us, 
because we have FTAs with six countries, India, Australia, New Zealand, China, Japan, Korea. And we are evolving these FTAs into one. And it's going to be the largest free trade area when and if we can achieve it. It will be 30% of global GDP. It will be 30% of global trade. It will be almost 50% of global population. We have the building blocks for it. You are interested in TPP. The U.S. is promoting TPP. Some of the ASEAN member states are interested in TPP. But this ASEAN Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, A-R-C-E-P, acronym, RCEP, already has the building blocks, already having momentum among and between ourselves. These are the areas, these are the uh, issues that Canadian business, Canadian ASEAN Business Council can certainly promote, can bring more of the best and the excellent of Canadian products, both in goods and in services to the region. Well, center of growth, center of gravity, fulcrum of emerging regional architectures, new growth area, and uh, the landscape is welcoming. The landscape, landscape is anticipating more engagement from Canada. And I think the l last few years, your government has been doing a very, very active engagement with us. We welcome that, and certainly we hope the people, the business of Canada will follow the lead, come and benefit from the landscape that we have built. With your help, with your support, from the beginning, for the last 35 years, we were 10 when you became our dialogue partner. Now we are 45. As I said, we were born when you were celebrating your centennial. Now we have traveled together for the past 45 years, 35 years, particularly with, between ASEAN and Canada. We have done a lot together for the benefit of the people both here and in Southeast Asia. And let me stop by saying, if 600 million people in ASEAN 10 countries can achieve what we have set out to achieve, our dreams, our vision, a country like Canada active on the world stage in many, many areas, the global community will have one less region to worry about because ASEAN and the ASEAN people will be able to take care of themselves with your support, with your help, with your encouragement. Thank you for the 35 years of friendship. Great. Uh, well, the Secretary General has uh, kindly agreed to stay, as I mentioned, to uh, respond to any questions you have, any comments you have. Um, just to get the ball rolling on, uh, and I should mention that there is a microphone here in the room, so if you have uh, a comment or a question, please go to that microphone so that the translators can pick up uh, and translate your question or your uh, remark. But just to kick off, uh, Surin, you were mentioning that there are significant opportunities for Canada in higher education in ASEAN. Uh, I think that's true, and we've benefited over the years from uh, many foreign students coming to Canada. In some ways, I'm more concerned about Canadians uh, not becoming detached from the rest of the world. And I think it's just as important for Canadian students to go and study elsewhere and not necessarily in foreign institutions elsewhere 
than it is for uh, us to receive foreign students. Naturally, our universities are, uh, view foreign students as a profit center. Who wouldn't? Um, but for the relationship to flourish, actually, Canadians need to continue engaging with the rest of the world. So my hope is that Canadian students will go to the uh, ASEAN universities in large numbers. They're a growing in quality in your own country, in Singapore, in Malaysia, and in Indonesia, notably. Um, there are terrific institutions to study in, mm. and I hope there will be uh, many of them. We certainly hope so, too. It has to be a two-way traffic. And uh, I think we need to promote more, uh, given the fact that uh, Canada is a Pacific nation, uh, as much as Atlantic nation. Uh, a peculiar position of Canada is you have to look west in order to get to the east. <laughs> uh, when we talk about the, uh, when we talk with the Europeans, they say we have a look east policy. <laughs> we welcome that, but here you can't say look east. You have to look west in order to get to the east. And um, I think if we are preparing for the future, if it is truly the, the Pacific century and we certainly try to work on that, uh, then uh, it's a long future. Then we need the human infrastructure. Then we, we need to build a human network in order to sustain our uh, cooperation, our relations into the future. I have just mentioned to uh, your Minister of International Cooperation, Mr. Fantoni, mm. uh, uh, about uh, promoting exactly uh, Canadian... Uh, researchers, Canadian students, Canadian graduate students, Canadian uh, students who are working on their PhDs to have better facility in Southeast Asia, to have better access to the issues, to the problems, to the people that they want to study. Because uh, without a better understanding between us, we won't have the human network that would help us uh, grow uh, in our relationship into the future. Uh, there was an institution in France called uh, INSEAD. Mm. Uh, the main cap campus is Fontainebleau. And uh, students were asked, uh, they have a campus in Singapore, and students were asked, if you were to have a choice between here and the campus in Singapore, where would you choose to be? 85, 90% of them said we would rather be in Singapore. Mm. Uh, because that's where the market is and because that's where the jobs are. That's where the, the growth uh, is, right there, sitting right in the middle of the, you know, uh, uh, the, the wider region of East Asia, India East. So um, uh, certainly Canadian uh, academics, Canadian researchers, Canadian um, uh, students, very much encouraged to come our way. So as I said, it has to be a two-way traffic. Terrific. Now, please, sir, go ahead. I'm very glad you're hearing so much about education and knowledge and uh, also business. Uh, from my point of view, I think that the Canada and Southeast Asia can work on the issues which we can call knowledge management, but also e-government. Canada is one of the leading countries, Singapore also, in building the e-government. E mm -hmm. uh, now, regarding education, it's not only middle class. I had the privilege to work in every ASEAN country, on, uh, and one of the issues is to bring knowledge, to share knowledge with the poorest people, to bring them. I'm not talking formal education. I'm talking about the means of sharing knowledge with remote communities which need the knowledge from hygiene to agriculture to, to everything. Mm. So, and I think that uh, uh, when we are talking from the point of view of knowledge sharing, building knowledge society, as you mentioned, it's a two-way street. Mm. We can learn a lot as a Canadians, mm. but also we can contribute to, to development of knowledge societies particularly in Southeast Asia. Maybe I am biased. I lived in Singapore for a mm. while, and, <laughs> and I work in every country. No. But I think it, it's a point to a knowledge society, knowledge sharing. And, uh, Thank you. Great. I would, we, 
we <laughs> yes, we certainly recognize the fact that we need to be more innovative. We need to do more in research and development. We need to do more in the development of technology. Uh, otherwise, because our models of growth, all of us, uh, Singapore included, until recently, all of us were open for capital from outside to invest <laughs> because we had the environment for it. <laughs> we had stability. We had continuity, as I said earlier. Uh, and then technology. Technology came from outside. Management of those investments came from outside. We produce goods and services for consumption in the internal markets, but at the earlier period, we were being used as bases for production to be distributed outside. So capital from outside, manage, uh, knowledge from outside, management from outside produced for external markets. We are trying to change that paradigm. What we are doing now is to avoid that what they call the middle income trap. And that is if you produce, if your industry is based on labor-intensive kind of uh, production, uh, raw materials available, and then very cheap environmental protection, many other countries around the world can follow the same model of growth. And we have to compete with those emerging economies. And we have found out that you know, everybody can catch up. We are going to be stuck in that middle income trap. Singapore is spending a lot of money on research, on development. The rest are not doing as much. So knowledge development, knowledge distribution, knowledge sharing, innovation, research and development are going to be the way of the future for, for us in the region. That's why it is extremely important to concentrate on education, on the younger generation. Otherwise, we'll be caught in this thing. We have to compete with every other emerging uh, markets who are doing exactly the same thing. And they have more people, mm. they have cheaper labor, mm. and they have less cost. Mm. We can't compete. Mm. So we have to get to the next level. Mm. Singapore is leading the way. Mm. Others are trying to catch up. Yes, knowledge-based industrialization. Please, sir, go ahead. Sorry, come out. Um, it seems that you may have answered uh, my question already, but um, I'm a scientist at the Otto Hospital, and my passion is in um, medical research mm -hmm. and education. My question is, what are ASEAN's plans and visions for increasing the medical and scientific research capacity, and not only the research capacity, but um, the human resources mm -hmm. that the ASEAN nations need in order to become more of an innovation-based society? Dan, so um, well, that's my question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we are doing quite well for medical tourism. <laughs> <laughs> you walk into our hospitals, they look like five-star hotels. Hmm. Uh, and combine the way in which, uh, you know, we treat people, uh, you know, smooth like silk, <laughs> uh, you know, friendly sky, hmm. um, all these things. Uh, I think uh, we are... Uh, quite well advanced, but uh, we need to do more innovation. We need to do more research. Uh, we need to do more development. Um, uh, I, I agree very much that uh, in the medical area, uh, we probably buy technology, like in other areas. Uh, we don't do enough of our own research, but things are changing. Uh, I think you will find um, uh, intellectual property in in various areas of medical uh, services are being registered more and more in Southeast Asia, certainly in Singapore, in Thailand, in Malaysia, in Indonesia. These are uh, a, a, a field of, of growth that, that we are doing, and we are coupling with other institutions mm. uh, around the world. 
not just among ourselves and between uh, ourselves, but uh, you know, drawing the best from from the rest of the world. And as I said, uh, at least three countries are now sent, uh, what you call uh, destinations of medical tourism: uh, Singapore, Thailand, and Malaysia. Mm. And and that could grow. Uh, quicker and faster. So if, if I could go. add to that a bit of an advert for, uh, first of all, um, the, the reality that the quality of science within the ASEAN region and the capacity of the research community within the ASEAN region is increasing all the time with everything else that's increasing. And IDRC supports quite a lot of work in Thailand, uh, Cambodia, Laos, southern China, at the intersection of human health, animal health, and environmental factors. Because that's often where viruses that strike the whole globe incubate. And the scientists doing that work are from those countries. They aren't us. Uh, so there's quite a lot going on that's extremely promising. The second thing I'd like to mention is through an initiative of the Canadian government under the umbrella of the Development Innovation Fund, you've probably been reading on websites and in the newspapers that there's a new institution called Grand Challenges Canada that's seeking to recognize uh, uh, medical innovators, exactly what you're interested in, uh, mostly in the developing world, sometimes in Canada working on uh, challenges of the developing world, often working together. So I hope you'll take an interest in that. Uh, I think Grand Challenges likes to advertise its competitions quite widely, but if you have trouble locating them, just let one of us know and we'll put you in touch. So <laughs> thank you very much for that question. I'm extremely optimistic, actually, <coughs> about science in uh, Southeast Asia. Sir, thank please. Thank you, sir. Excellency. My name is Safwat Ayub of the South North Forum, and I wonder uh, on the front of economic integration, uh, what are your plans? Are there any achievements? Are there any uh, indicators? Indica uh, economic integration yeah. between the ASEAN countries? Yes, that's one important pillar and it's probably uh, most uh, appealing to the people because they could feel it themselves. Uh, more products, more services that they can access to, and um, better quality uh, of, the, of these products. So uh, free, free flow of goods, of services, one production base. It has to be equitable among us, 600 million, not you know, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. The gap has to be bridged. And then... Uh, the other, the other objective is to be able to be competitive with the rest of the world, be seamlessly integrated into the global marketplace. And that's what, what we are doing. Um, you, can, you can look at some of the figures that would be indicative to, to this effort. FDI uh, uh, proportionately is higher than the rest of the world going into uh, the ASEAN countries. Per capita income is bigger than going into China and then going into India uh, because it is growing and it is opening up and it's, uh, it's uh, you know. And the best part of, of the figure of about 90 billion U.S. dollars in 2011, 70 percent going into the service sector, meaning the people and the consumers would like a quality of life and service would like better education for their children, would like better health care, would like better telecommunication, would like better logistics. Seventy percent of FDI is about almost um, 100 billion going into the service sector. I, I guess it means that the region is teeming with growing and uh, uh, middle class and, and rising purchasing power. Uh, and those are the areas that we have to concentrate ourselves in, and it's extremely appealing to the people because it talks about the pockets. It talks about the, the choices on the supermarket shelves. 
and the price and the quality. Uh, but we are working on other things too, mm. political insecurity and mm. socio-cultural, on uh, uh, trying to create a, a new identity for our people, the second identity, being Singaporean and ASEAN, being Indonesian and ASEAN, being Filipino and ASEAN. Uh, that's what we are trying to do. When we, when we say this to the Europeans, we like to do what you have achieved. And they said, um, much less than you think we, we have achieved. <laughs> and that Thank is you. The second that, choice. Uh, I'm afraid yeah. there's somebody else behind you. We yeah, need but to get within the question, you, uh, would that mean just briefly, that, uh, yeah, lead to a common market one day? Well, <laughs> let's say an integrated one production base and uh, one uh, combined uh, uh, integrated market, but we are not thinking about one currency. Mm -hmm. No. The European okay. Union has not given us good uh, example. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, for, thank you for the talk and thank you for coming here. Um, personally, I would like to recommend studying in Southeast Asia. I had a wonderful time in Singapore. Mm. Great. Uh, my question was originally going to be about economic integration, but that's been taken. So I'll ask you instead about institutional integration between ASEAN countries. So I was just wondering how you saw the future of ASEAN institutional integration and the future of the ASEAN Secretariat as an organization itself. Hmm. Great. And perhaps we can take the point of the gentleman behind you, who I think okay. also, and, and then we'll close out with you both. Uh, thank you for speaking today. I'll second the comments about studies in Southeast Asia. I studied at Tamasat, and uh, oh. I very much enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did you study? Sorry. Uh, Kanasetasat. Oh, really? Yeah. Economics. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, I just would like to know if you'd be able to comment more on Canada's strengths and weaknesses in terms of engaging Myanmar economically. Uh, okay. That's kind of the zeitgeist at the moment in terms of uh, opportunities and uh, in Southeast Asia. I'm wondering uh, what, uh, aside education, what would Canada have to leverage in terms of increasing its mm -hmm. relations with Myanmar? All right. And specifically within that, uh, Australia has made a big effort for uh, Australian citizens to learn Southeast Asian languages and Asian languages in general, especially at universities like the ANU, for example. I'm wondering if uh, you see that as being important to Canada, to Canadians, considering, for example, that the working language for ASEAN uh, and the working language for this second nationality that you're talking about, um, ASEAN citizenship is English. Mm. So, for example, in engaging a country like Myanmar, would it be important that uh, young Canadians who are interested in doing that learn uh, Myanmar in the first place or not? Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, well, you. The, the first question, institutional uh, development of ASEAN, we have to try to strike the balance between um, uh, trying to integrate together and become uh, a, 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 a one a group unit of, of countries uh, similar to what the European Union has achieved. But I have always been saying that European Union is our inspiration, not our model, because of the diversity among us. Tremendous diversity. I mean, a monarchy is there. Well, two or three monarchies, <laughs> but certainly an active monarchy involved in, um, in, um, in even management uh, uh, of the country is still there. Uh, two or three communist countries, two communist countries, uh, one or two very strong one-party system, pretty much, and uh, a couple of noisy democracies <laughs> uh, like Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Uh, very open, very participatory, very, very active. Uh, diversity in governance, diversity in cultures, in religion, in history would not allow us to go into the union kind of uh, evolution. Uh, uh, we understand that. Uh, so we have to be very, very careful. Now, people have criticize us for practicing this thing called non-interference principle. But non-interference is a basis of international relations anywhere. It's, it's in the UN Charter, particularly in uh, uh, countries like Southeast Asia. Because of the diversity, we have to be very, very careful 
Otherwise, we couldn't hold together. So the lowest common denominator, we can move at the speed that the slowest member could move. Frustrating at times, being, being criticized at mm -hmm. other times, and being complained at uh, many times. But the only way that we could keep things together is to go at the speed comfortable to all. So institutions have to evolve very, very slowly. We can't think about the union. We can only think about now a community. We have been association for a long, long time. ASEAN is the association of Southeast Asian nations. Now we want to go into the community, which means we can be building more common uh, 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 future, common approaches to things, common, uh, uh, you know, closer coordination on various issues, but can't think about the union until way, way into the future. Therefore, one currency is not on the table. Uh, the Secretariat, again, because of this diversity, which is different from in Europe, Europe, they could create this thing called the Central Mechanism, which is known as the European Commission or the, the Commission, and would have the policy-making uh, power that would have even... Um, um, you know, uh, initiatives that every member state will have to take and bring it from Brussels down to the member states. ASEAN doesn't have that kind of arrangement. Uh, sovereignty is still very much in the, in the capitals. Decision making is very much in the capitals. Therefore, how much can this central mechanism called the ASEAN Secretariat be allowed to grow and to develop and to evolve? It cannot be too big, too much, too fast until the, the, mm -hmm. the, the members are comfortable with. Having said that, member states, the leaders realize that in order to evolve into a community, you need a rather active and uh, uh, well-resourced secretariat, uh, able to take some initiatives, uh, able to engage with the in, in, uh, international players, and we are looking into that. Again, we have to reach the balance of member states who are still very much uh, jealous of the power and the sovereignty and the decision-making power and the way in which we want to evolve together. We need a central mechanism that is effective. And that's what's being considered now. And I am in the process of writing that report, having spent five years there, first five years under the charter. Uh, we are looking into that. Uh, that's the answer to your question. The, the next question was about... Um, from student Tamasat, sorry? Yes. Oh, oh, of yeah. Canada, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and language. You know, Canada, yes. Canada has the brand name. Canada has the good, goodwill. Canada have that stamp of excellence in so many things. But Canada markets itself less than others who have less excellent things. Uh, your education, for example. Uh, your technology. Uh, the... Every time I talk about Canada, I talk about multiculturalism that you have. You have been able to evolve and have been able to establish. Well, that is the way of the future. That's one thing that I think the rest of the world uh, would certainly want to know how, how, you, know, how you can uh, construct such a system through trial and error, of course, through a lot of challenges. But eventually, uh, it's, it's a society that is very much living the, the multiculturalism concept, pluralism concept. And that is uh, the, way, the way of the global community into the future. I think you need to do more um, and, 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 and you know, try to, to show and try to convey such a message with confidence. And I think uh, this government is uh, 
you know, beginning to do a sustained effort uh, in that direction. Well, English is the working language of ASEAN, yes. But by the time the community comes into being, half of ASEAN will be speaking Malay. <laughs> half of the 600 million will be speaking Malay. Well, 245 is already in Indonesia. Mm. Uh, Malaysia, Southern Thailand, Southern Philippines, in Cambodia, and uh, Brunei. And, you know, people in Singapore speak Malay too. Mm. You realize that the national anthem of Singapore is still in Malay. <laughs> they have not changed. Mm. Yep, the, the national anthem of Singapore is in Malay, in the Malay language. So, um, Malay language is going to be a language of facility in the region. But uh, we know uh, uh, that, uh, you know, to be pra pragmatic about it, we need one central language that is communicable for our people, our trader, our business, our um, people in the area of technology, education, diplomacy, and trade, and that is English. English is the working language of ASEAN. It's in the charter. If you speak English, and I assume you do, uh, you, know, you, you can do well in the, in the region, yes. Uh, Canada and, and, and Myanmar, um, I think all of us could claim credit for the opening up of Myanmar. Uh, Canada has been tough on ASEAN on the issue of Myanmar. Uh, many of the activities as partner, as dialogue partner, we could not uh, 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 develop fully because of the issue of Myanmar or the sanction on Myanmar in the past. And it's not only Canada. Australia is the same, New Zealand is the same, uh, the U.S. and the European Union. They are all the, all the same. So, but together we have been able to help Myanmar grow out of its own shadow of the past and uh, right now it's opening up and I, I think uh, uh, its opportunities and potentiality are very much there. Um, oil and gas, uh, minerals, uh, education, uh, innovation, uh, certainly you can bring to Myanmar. Uh, close to 60 million people is a big market, large country with tremendous resources strategically located between the two giants of emerging markets, giants of East Asia. So um, I think uh, you, know, you have sent ministers there. Uh, that is a very, very uh, good development. And uh, uh, I would think there will be a lot of opportunities. And I know that your business community is very much waiting to go in uh, uh, when when things are in place, they have just come up with uh, foreign investment uh, law, uh, uh, and they are they are doing it very quick. Uh, so to the surprise of a lot of people, and um, the reconciliation inside is going well. Uh, are we worried about the reversal? Well, we have made it clear that we expect no no reversal because the chairmanship of ASEAN that was given to Myanmar for the year 2014 is understood that it's based on irreversibility of the way in which Myanmar is evolving, is opening up. Uh, so uh, all in all, I think uh, we, could, um, we, could be, uh, uh, we could claim uh, some credits on, on our part that we, we have helped Myanmar to as I said, to emerge out of its own long shadow of the past. And it's a country of tremendous potential. And, um, and I think they deserve uh, a lot of your attention and a lot of your, your cooperation and your support, uh, CEDA and, and IDRC and all other areas. Education tremendously, they need help, and there will be opportunities for, for Canada. And... Um, all in all, I think um, um, in East Asia, in ASEAN, um, you do things uh, in a way that people don't feel being imposed upon. And people are very moderate. People are quite open. People are uh, flexible and accommodating. 
and welcome engagement with the, with the rest of the world. In fact, let me drop you with this idea and, and let Mr. David Malone write a book on it. <laughs> In fact, I believe that the road to reconciliation between the West and the Muslim world, that road may very well run through Southeast Asia. Because there is a moderation there, there is flexibility there, there is accommodation there, and there is a sense of uh, uh, being, being open and uh, welcome innovation and welcome changes. You find extremism in Southeast Asia, but there are pockets. They are not the mainstream. And, um, and that, I think, is uh, a good foundation for future cooperation uh, and come to Southeast Asia and look in which the way we live, our religions, not to the extreme, but always in moderation. And I think that's good for the world. Thanks. Thanks so much, Surin. Uh, that's terrific. Um, a, a couple of months ago, I suppose it was, uh, right after the ASEAN summit, uh, foreign ministers around Surin gathered, uh, and not just the foreign ministers of ASEAN, the leading foreign ministers from all over the world flew in, uh, our own, John Baird, Hillary Clinton, uh, everybody was there. Uh, and that wouldn't be happening in many other parts of the world. It's no coincidence that that is the one regional organization whose uh, global uh, outreach effort is so successful with the leading uh, countries of the world. It's not just the money, it seems to me, because it is true that Asia is growing very fast, but happily other parts of the developing world are also growing fast uh, today. I think uh, it's because of the weight of Asia as well as the wealth of Asia. Uh, about half of the world's population are there. Um, very important tectonic uh, plates under Asia are beginning to rub up against each other. That worries Asians. It also worries those in the rest of the world. Clearly, ASEAN has a role to play in resolving uh, the tensions, which is why they arose, actually, at that uh, meeting of the ASEAN Regional uh, Forum. So, Surin, thank you so much for coming to share with us today how Canadians can connect with uh, the ASEAN region through knowledge, through education, of course, through trade, through science. There are so many vectors through which uh, we can reach Asia. The only, it seems to me, dumb choice by Canadians would be simply not to reach out to Asia at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you, sir.